Welcome to the Atlas Project broadcast. The Atlas Project is a weekly chapter-by-chapter -chapter online discussion group about Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, in celebration of the 60th anniversary of the publication of the novel in 1957. Every week, no later than Thursday, we will post discussion questions about the latest chapter for readers to discuss in real life or on our Facebook group. After reviewing the resulting discussion, we'll present a live broadcast every Tuesday night in which we'll discuss the most interesting aspects of the week's reading in light of your contributions. Participants should remember the three basic ground rules. Be civil, be relevant, and most importantly, don't post spoilers about sections of the novel we've not yet read. Experienced readers who wish to discuss spoilers should join the Atlas Project Spoilers Group on Facebook. Links to our groups and other relevant group material are available at atlasproject.live. And now, enjoy the broadcast. I'm Ben Baer. I'm coming to you from New Orleans. With me is my friend and colleague, Greg Salmeri. This is episode two of the Atlas Project. Uh, the bumper music that you saw at the beginning should have given you the basics of how this project is working. So I have just a few quick announcements about things that are special about our broadcast tonight. So as before, we want to be encouraging first-time readers to be the ones who are uh, suggest who are making comments and asking questions during the course of the broadcast. And what that means, especially for people who are watching online, uh, is we would like you, if you are a first-time reader, when you are making a comment online, to preface your post with the capital letters FTR. That'll be that'll make it easier for us to see that you are uh, making a comment and who you are. Uh, and then the second thing I'd like uh, to encourage everybody to think about when they are commenting online is the fact that if lots of people are commenting all the time, it makes the comments go by much more quickly. And that makes it a lot harder to follow uh, for us. And, uh, but we want to be interacting with the online audience. And so we want to be able to read the comments as they go by. And so I'd like people who are watching to think carefully before they comment. Uh, there's a lot of you out there in the world. And so uh, if you want to react to something that's being said, in the broadcast, rather than typing something in the comment form, please just use one of the Facebook reaction emoticons, whether happy or angry or sad or what have you, or if you want to laugh at something I say, uh, which I encourage when it's funny, uh, do it that way, uh, just like that, yeah. Uh, but otherwise, please restrict uh, your comments only to times when, if you were in a class, you would want to raise your hand in a normal classroom setting where you have something that you want to contribute to the conversation or, or a question that you want to ask, that's when uh, you should be, that's when you should be, uh, that's when you should be saying something in the comment section. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Greg now, who is going to set us up uh, on some of the initial details of this chapter, chapter two, the chain. I will turn it over to Greg. Hi, everyone, and hi, everyone here in person. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about uh, just a little bit about what we learn about Reardon's professional life and career from the beginning of Chapter 2. Chapter 2 opens uh, on people driving past uh, Reardon Steel. We learn that the first heat of Reardon metal is being poured, and uh, we get a lot of narration of Reardon's thoughts uh, during this process and as he's walking home afterwards. And through that, I think we learn a fair amount about him as a character and about uh, his career up until this point. So I just want to take a few moments to just elicit some of the points about that uh, from you guys. What stood out to you um, in this reading about Reardon as a business person. We'll get to his home life, which is where he's headed on this walk uh, a little bit later, but just about his career as a businessman, uh, as a steel magnate now, and he had other hats before that. Any thoughts, anything in particular stand out from his recollections? Mohammed? The sheer length of time he's devoted to his latest endeavor, Reardon Metal, even though he was. He said a steel magnate before, and he could have just stopped there. And he just kept devoting time and time to his new metal. Good. So I'm not sure how well people in, in the outer world are hearing Muhammad. Ben, you can tell me if, if he's coming through well. 
uh, but I'll just repeat in case not what he said. And he was impressed by the sheer length of time he focused on the Reardon Metal Project, working on it for 10 years. That's a long time to work on anything. But in particular, Mohammed pointed out, this is someone who's already very successful. He already has a, uh, a, the best steel company in the country, and yet he's not content to run it or to make incremental improvements with it. He wants to take a long time out on this major project to, to revolutionize uh, uh, metallurgy. Metallurgy? How do you say that? Metallurgy. metallurgy. Um, and I think you know, we see that this is a, a more general feature of Reardon, right? So now that he has Reardon Steel, he's spending this time inventing Reardon Metal, but what happened prior to this? Are there, I think we get evidence of a lot of times when he didn't quit while he was ahead, so to speak, and got further ahead. Carrie Ann? He also starts up from the bottom at age 14. He works his way up through the mills, learning every level of the endeavor. So he's somebody who didn't just walk in and think he can be an executive or an innovator, but somebody who knows the ropes at every stage and can appreciate all aspects of the job. Good. So Reardon is a self-made man in, in every, in the strongest sense. He starts as a, I guess, a miner in Minnesota of ore mines. Right, and he works his way up to now the head of the industry for which ore is used, namely the steelmaking industry. And we learn that he has also uh, Reardon coal and Reardon limestone. It's not as clear to me if limestone is involved in, in steelmaking. Uh, coal certainly is, and ore is. Ed, is, is limestone? You're nodding. Um, I don't know if, or if it's a separate... A uh, separate business concern he has, but we see that he's worked his way up from the very bottom of this industry to uh, a captain of it, and in a way where he has different holdings in different parts of the industry. Right? He has an ore uh, mine, he has a, a, a steel a mill, and so forth. And we'll see that that's really relevant to his ability to be such a good uh, steel producer um, later on. We'll get we'll learn a little more about that in chapter three. So what's motivating him this whole time? Why doesn't he stop when he owns the ore mine that he started working in, or when he has the first steel plant, or uh, you know when he's got that limestone? Do we learn anything about that? Yeah. He, he does imagine how his product will make people's lives better. Okay, so he imagines how his product, at least in, we, we don't hear so much about that with the other products, but we do with Reardon Metal, right? We think as he's thinking about Reardon Metal, he's thinking about the uses of it, ways in which it'll improve people's life. There's a beautiful woman cutting a piece of fruit, and he thinks, you know, I'll have a better metal for her knife than that. Uh, and he's thinking about, he's kind of obsessing almost over things that a, a metal better than steel could do every time he sees something made of metal. So it, at, at least in the case of the, the spending the 10 years designing Reardon Metal, part of what's driving him is maybe a desire to improve people's lives, um, maybe just an idea that there can be a better kind of metal. And it's described that the one thought that was in his mind all this time is a metal that, something that would be to steel as steel had been to iron. So, uh, we have to fill in some of the blanks of how he's understanding how steel was to iron to, to know, to, to, to get the full of that motivation. If you think what he's thinking is uh, steel helped people much more than iron, um, then what he's thinking is something that'll help people much more even than steel. And I do think that's part of it. I mean, he wants it to be useful. But he seems to be focused on just how much better it will be at the tasks, I think. That seems to be kind of uh, the the mode in which he, he, his mind takes, takes it in. Um, anything else about him and his attitude towards his career that really comes across from this fought first walk home? Uh, Ed? There was one line that struck me, <coughs> said, and that is that he, thinks, uh, he wonders why happiness hurts. And I think the reason that he thinks that happiness hurts is that he had not yet met Bagney or Francisco. In other words, when you're happy, you want to share it with someone. Mm -hmm. and he, yeah, we're, we're, we are worrying about spoilers going forward. Um, we, none of us have met Francisco yet, and so forth. But we have met Dagny, 
And uh, it does, and uh, it is really striking that um, he feels that happiness can hurt. It does seem like there's a kind of loneliness that he feels. And have we met any characters yet who it seems like, you know, he's looking for something. He's wanting some kind of bond with people. People who like him are are hungry to uh, for sites of success. And I think, um, I don't think it's a spoiler to reflect that Dagny, who we've already met, would be very pleased to, to see this. After all, he's pouring the metal for her railroad. We've already seen how much she likes it, right? Now, he has met Dagny, right? I mean, she's already ordered this from him. But um, and they have a business relationship, and we'll learn more about that later. But for whatever reason, she's not someone he thinks to call and tell how excited he is about the metal. Um, yeah, Iris? Uh, I just want to say something that really was important to me as I got further into this chapter, this was so unpleasant, was that he had one really nice experience uh, in the paperback at the top of page 35, the workers saw him, this is he's leaning back with his eyes closed, uh, grinned in understanding like a fellow accomplice in a great celebration who knew why that tall blonde figure had had to be present here tonight. Reardon really smiled in answer. And just, you know, that's, that's what he deserves. Yeah, I think it's significant that, although in, in a lot of ways the world we're seeing in this novel is very dark, and a, a lot of the characters are missing some of what they want out of life. We also get these indications that it's not solidly 100% that way. And even on a night where Reardon is, is missing something that he wants more of, we get uh, in this one exchange um, indication that he does have some of it, maybe not as much as he'd like. So I'll submit one more time the question, if, if my mic holds out. Uh, how is... How is uh, Reardon thinking about his relations to other people uh, as he's walking home? What are the thoughts he's thinking about? I mean, it connects to his own internal psychology. And I'll see if people are picking me up online. They say I'm sounding good. So Reardon's really, he, Reardon has just poured his first heat the first pour of the first heat of Reardon metal. He's been working on it for 10 years. How does this make him feel? What does he want to do because of it? Be alone. Does he really want to be alone? Well, he, um, I have, he never felt loneliness except when he was happy. He, oh, so, he never felt loneliness except when he's happy. What does that mean? That, um, that if he is happy from pouring his first batch of weird metal, then he is one. But why would somebody feel lonely when they're happy? Because there's nobody sharing it with. Because there's nobody worth sharing it with. Mm, or, yeah, yeah. Okay. Jonathan online says uh, he wants to celebrate. Paul Saunders says the same thing. Uh, so, I mean, he, he's... It's not that loneliness makes him happy, right? It's that he's lonely because he's happy and there's nobody to share it with, right? Uh, and there's some connection here, if, if you think about it, to the very beginning of the chapter. What's the big visual image that we get kind of about Reardon's uh, whole, uh, his factory and his life that, he, that connects those two together? Well, the train sees something, and a journalist sees something from the train about the factory and writes down a note about it. What does the journalist write down a note about? It? Reardon's, name is everywhere. Reardon's name is everywhere. He puts his name on everything, and you can infer what you like about uh, someone who would put his name on everything. Reardon or Reardon Lime, Reardon Steel. And Reardon wants to put a bigger sign on top of everything that says what? Reardon Life. Reardon Life. One question here is why is he why is he wanting to put his name on everything, and is it just because he's vain? 
He's proud. He's proud. There's a difference between being proud and being vain. We talked already about wanting to share it. He wanted to share his achievements with other people. Where, where do you see uh, in, in particular uh, him? Well, I, should, I, should, I think I should move on a little bit because I can sum up a bit. I mean, he's, so he's, he's so happy that he's kind of got this overwhelming uh, sense of, of, uh, of overflowing of his happiness. And he wants other people to see it. And he has this theory, right? Is, what, what's his theory about happiness? Happiness is a greatest agent of purification. Agent of purification right? if, if only other people could be happy, uh, it, it does something for them. Uh, and he's happy, and he wishes other people could feel the same way. They could be, they could be purified in the same way. Um, and so he's thinking about this, and he's wanting to share his happiness with others. He's looking to celebrate. Uh, there's one instance at the very beginning of the book where he achieves this, one small instance. What is it? There's one small instance where he gets this kind of shared happiness, this shared uh, recognition of his own achievement. It's a very, it goes by fast. Does anybody online know, know what I'm talking about? Yes. Daniel, do you know? Uh, yes, on page 35 of the Mass Market paperback, a worker saw him and grinned in understanding. The worker. Who knew why that tall blonde figure had had to be present here tonight. And we yeah, so he, he does, and Megan online sees this too, and so does Pooja. Uh, so the, he does get to share this happiness for just a brief moment with the worker online. And, but he feels lonely because the worker is the only one, right? If only there were more people. Where might he find such people? Well, he's going home to his family. But now let me see what more people have to say. I mean, what does he get from his family? Just love and affection, you know, <laughs> pure, limitless. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. Ben seems to have frozen. Um, and now Ben is back. Uh, well, while I'm, while I'm here with you, I should say also to add to our list of, of people who noticed the worker, Carrie Ann mentioned that, that here when we were on before, but I'm not sure if the mic picked it up. Or Iris did. Or Iris did, sorry. Iris did and, and read a bit of it. Um, anyway, but back, back to you now that the audio is working. Okay, so we, we get that uh, his family is not, at the very least, the family is not there to share in his happiness, right? And we've got various responses here, but what in fact, they, what they're sharing instead, contempt, uh, sarcasm, they, they criticize him for not caring enough about, uh, about them, for having been late for this dinner. And what's Reardon's response? He started <clears throat> to explain, but then held back because he knew they wouldn't understand. And so he starts to explain, but he holds back because he doesn't think they'll understand. And then when they make the most pointed criticisms, like you were late and you forgot about the dinner and you forgot about the anniversary, our anniversary coming up, what's, he apologizes. Yeah. So uh, he, not only does he uh, get this criticism and these guilt trips from his family, but he kind of concedes it to a certain extent. And so you can start to get a sense of why he was so reluctant to go home, if this is what he's come to expect and this is what he's gotten used to. Um, Greg, uh, I think that now is a good time to have a little bit of back and forth, if, if you want, uh, before we talk about the particular members of the family. OK. Uh, one thing we should think about is this is clearly a dysfunctional family, right? I mean, they're, they're not getting along well. It's, um, it's worth thinking about the sides of that, right? There are some people I know who've read this and some bloggers who put a, uh, a lot of the blame on Reardon for this. I think we should think about as we go through the novel how much of his responsibility, how much is theirs. 
uh, and in what ways each of them is involved in this. But, but however we want to understand it, uh, it's definitely a case where these are not people who care about and respect each other. And, and one thing that I think is worth noting about Reardon, in addition to his apologizing, right, is his first reactions to all these things are disgust, anger, indifference, uh, you know, really strong emotions, in, in one case, disgust at his mother, right? And then he thinks about it and he determines that, no, that response he's having is unjust, and therefore he doesn't respond the way he's tempted to respond, but instead he either apologizes or in some cases he just kind of, I don't know if he grins and bears it, but he's just kind of mute about it. And we want to, you know, come to understand as we go through the book more that dynamic, but that's just something something to note. Uh, Iris here has something she wants to say about that. Let me just put her on for a, a moment, see if we can hear her. I think I've got this audio working. Uh, page 39 of The Mass Market, uh, when Philip tells him he works too hard, he laughs at it and says, I like it. And uh, even then, after he's told he's neurotic, oh, Phil, for Christ's sake. Phil, so say, there are times when he really... Uh, where he really does speak the truth of what he's feeling. Okay, so at, at so, he doesn't always apologize, but I think he does apologize when the alternative would be to say something to, to attack them. In other words, so Philip says, you know, why don't you ever have some fun? Why don't you have a good time? And he says, oh, I, I'm having a pretty good time, Philip, today. And he hopes Philip's going to ask him why, and Philip doesn't. But that's not a time when he's tempted to insult Philip. And there is a time when he's tempted to do that a little bit later, right? And he holds back. Uh, he thinks it would be inappropriate in some way to do it. Um, let me, um, let me cut, cut back to you, Ben, to carry on with us. Okay, I missed a little bit of what you were saying there, but uh, I take it it's okay for me to get started on Mom and Philip. So... It's, I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about Reardon's relationships to uh, his, his family, uh, and Greg is then going to talk about Lillian. Um, am I back? You did well, get knocked going. off and you're back now. I don't know why that's happening. Um, so we don't get much description of Reardon's mother, but what's the first thing that she says to him when he, when he uh, shows up at home? You're late. What is? I mean, they're all saying that, but what is? What does she say? What does she ask of him in particular? Don't say you're sorry. Why would someone say don't say you're sorry about having uh, offended social graces? She doesn't think he's really sorry. Uh, why doesn't she think he's really sorry? She's his mother. She knows he's not sorry. She, well, she knows something about him. She knows something about his habits. Uh, she knows... She knows that he likes... Uh, he, he loves his work too much. Jesse on, online says the same thing. She says, you could have called... You know, later she says, you could have made it if, if, you, uh, if you wanted to, but you love your work too much, right? Kind of seems to be an aspect of her trying to deliberately make a point of saying it, not really trying to be saying it to make him feel bad. Well, so that's the question. What is her motive here? I mean, is she, in fact, being patronizing on purpose? Is this a kind of weird uh, maternal relationship to an adult, you know, for an adult child to have, uh, or is, is she really, is Reardon really done something wrong here and he needs to be uh, sanctioned for it in effect? Uh, I mean, if he shouldn't have been late and if he should be thinking more about his family members, wouldn't she have reason to actually make that criticism? That's something to think about. Yeah. It's always to me. It kind of seems like she's one of the only people that actually understands him, even though she's condescending about it. Because she calls him out straight on his habits and says, "Don't apologize," because she knows he's not sorry, and like acknowledges. I don't know if I'm overstepping with that. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, she knows more about him, and she she's the one who later criticizes him as being selfish. Um, later on, you know, she tries to be, it sounds at first like she's trying to be a little bit nicer. She says, have you had dinner yet? Uh, and he says, uh, yes, well, no. Uh, and what does she say in response to that? That he never ate right. He never, he never ate right, and, and nobody will ever, uh, what's that? Nobody could ever make you eat properly. Nobody, you'll never, you'll never let anybody help you, right? So what's going on here? Is she like a, just a classic doting mother who's wanting to correct his behavior, who misses him because he's not, he's away at the factory too much? Uh, or is there some other, you know, relationship here, some other motive? And if, if, if it's something else, what is it? I see people online saying, well, he's, she's guilting him. But why? why? I mean, there's different reasons somebody might guilt somebody else. It might be because the person deserves the guilt. Uh, it might be because of something else. Uh, Judy says she's being vicious. Well, what's, what, is the, what is it that she's doing wrong? I mean, why isn't she just correcting Reardon for his improper behavior? It gives her a certain kind of power. Well, maybe, What's um, the evidence for that claim? I mean, why I think that it's that and not that he's doing something wrong? Maybe that if depends. she had only um, asked why he was late. Okay. Uh, if only she had asked why he was late. Ben's disappeared again. I'm sure he'll be back up in a moment. But, I mean... They're, they're on the issue of why Reardon is late and um, why his mother reacts as she does. One thing to keep in mind, both in defense of Reardon's mother and in defense of Reardon and possibly against Reardon's mother, is that this is a pattern. If your son is late every day and every time you say you have someone over for dinner and so forth and he never turns up and and so forth, then it's more understandable why on this occasion when he says, oh, I was late today because it was a busy day, she says, well, you're always busy. You don't care about about uh, Mrs. Beecham. Mrs. Beecham was here today. Why do you care? But it's not something special. He doesn't care about Mrs. Beecham or any of this stuff. Uh, on the other hand, does anyone have a counterpoint to that? Um, so it's true, in fact, that Reardon doesn't care about Miss Beecham and the other kinds of things that his mother wants him to care about. And his apology is sort of insincere. I mean, he doesn't really feel bad that he's late. He feels bad in some sense that he's violating some more or norm, but, uh, you know, it doesn't really seem to mean that much to him. Al? Well, I think we're given a general clue to, to Reardon's psychology uh, that affects his, both how he approaches work and family uh, in the hardcover edition on page 30 in the middle. After a while, he realized that he was thinking, and then there's the phrase, he despised memories as a pointless indulgence. Memories are selective. He, he, he wasn't worried about remembering which, which shoe he tied first 25 years ago. He despised, presumably, memories that meant something to him, he thought of it as an indulgence. And that, I think, suggests someone who perhaps isn't in touch with his emotions, doesn't want to be. And that's a, that, I think that's a serious uh, issue. So one possibility is that Reardon is someone who's out of touch with his emotions. Al says the fact that he despises memories is uh, an example of that. And maybe his mother's right. I mean, he doesn't have a good relationship with his family because he's a guy who's out of touch with his emotions. And... That's a possibility. I mean, one thing to notice in that earlier scene when he talks about despising uh, memories, he then um, knows, notices why he's having these memories tonight uh, in token of the chain of metal in his pocket, and then he permits himself to, to go back and look back on them. And so uh, what I take from that scene, whatever judgment we're going to ultimately pass on it, is that this is someone who's very controlled, right? And uh, sometimes he will indulge in certain emotions, but not as a, a default. And he needs a reason for doing it, and he's thoughtful about when he's going to do it. And does that remind us of anyone else that we've encountered in the book? Yeah. 
Right, Daphne. I mean, she's presented in our first scene with her as, um, as uh, thinking, okay, now it's okay to feel when she's hearing the the concerto right being whistled. She's ready to uh, she's ready to uh, feel, and that's a, a bond, a, a similarity. I think we're seeing between her and her and Reardon. I, I want to kind of cut back to Ben to talk a little more about uh, about Reardon's mother and the situation they're in. Ben, are you? Are you ready? You look like you were getting ready. Ben, I'm not hearing you now. Ben, Ben, pause it. So let me just make another observation about his mother, which I think is significant for the mother and and Philip. And Ben, just talk when you uh, when you're ready to talk again, and then I'll I'll switch you on. Um, so Reardon isn't interested in the things his mother is interested in and meeting his mother's friend, Miss Beecham, and all these other kinds of people. I guess Mrs. Beecham. Uh, and the doorknobs, the slum children, are making all up by their own. Uh, and he's not all that interested in what Philip's doing. I mean, he, uh, he's heard about the various organizations that are having lectures on collective farming or something, but he doesn't... You know, he care, he tries to take an interest, but it's not something that really is motivating to him. Um, and so you might think he's being a bad family member and not caring about these things. Is there any counterpoint point to make about this? I mean, is his family keeping up their end of this? It's sort of a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> In other words, neither Reardon nor the others care at all about anything that the others are doing. Ed says it's the, an anti-symbiotic relationship. That is, another, they, these people have a total discontinuity of values. So it's true, Reardon doesn't care about Miss Beecham or whatever, but on the other hand, why is his mother sticking him with dinner guests that he doesn't have anything to do with? I mean, it's not as though... Now, uh, you think, well, Miss Beecham wants to talk about the classes in metallurgy they're having for the slum children, so maybe, maybe they think they have a common interest, but I think... The implication is Miss Beecham's going to hit him up for money for these things, right? So it's not as though she's on the lookout for things that he would enjoy. And you don't get any sense that they care what happened at his mills. They uh, don't, now they don't know until he tells them that this was the day he poured the first heat of Reardon Metal. But it's in the newspapers all over the place that there's going to be, that the Reardon Metal is this new product. They know it's a busy time and a special time in his business. No one thinks to ask him any questions about it. So, um, you know, it seems like if he's being insensitive to their interests, it's a two-way street here. Yeah, go ahead. I, I suspect that if Mrs. Beecham had contacted him beforehand and said, hey, can you spare us some of your weird metals so our slum kids can fill some doorknobs door out of it, he'd probably be really excited about it. <laughs> but, but because it's made out of, it's, it's almost as if they're, they're snubbing his achievement by doing something far beneath what he's working on and then making him feel bad for not being interested. Yeah. They have no interest in I suppose that, I mean, weird and metal, it turns out, requires super hot furnaces, so maybe it's not the place for the slum kids to yeah, start. But, but you have to get beyond it. Yeah, but the point is they're not really making an effort to reach out to him, I think. And so there's a this anti-symbiotic relationship, as Ed says, where neither side is interested in the things the other is. Um, but, but Reardon's paying the bills. And there's also a difference in the way they deal with the fact that they're not interested in what the other person is interested in. Yeah. All right, I want to go to question two. How does Lillian's treatment of Hank compare to the rest of his family? Um, let me actually just make one more point before we switch to Lillian, which is our next, our next big topic. Just, can anybody sum up what the difference is? So it, here's a fact, right? These people don't have much in common in terms of what they care about. What Reardon cares about and what his family cares about is different. Um, is there a difference between the way the two of them deal with that? That is, the family members on the one hand and, and Hank on the other. Yeah, Muhammad. Uh, well, the family seems to kind of throw these snide jabs, um, like, oh, were you polishing some hunk of metal, you know. Um, it's, it's always, they try to make light of what he's doing, but whereas Reardon's 
just takes the form of I'm not going to talk to them about um, you know Paul Larkin's infinite charities or uh, Mrs. Beecham. I mean, he's just going to ignore it. Whereas they kind of focus in on that thing which they don't like about him. Or yeah, his family members demean and condescend openly the things that he cares about. You don't care about anything but business. Henry, you're selfish and nothing means anything to you if it's not associated with your business. You don't care about Paul, uh, about Mrs. Beecham and the slum children and so forth. They're, they're constantly down on him and, and um, haranguing him for caring about the things he does and not caring about the things they do. Uh, what's Reardon's uh, uh, approach by res by contrast to that. I mean, does Reardon say, you know, screw you, Miss Beecham's a bitch. I don't like her and the damn slum children. I couldn't care less about them. And what does she want to always hit me up for money here? Why do you drag me to these boring parties? You know, I don't. The, the, we don't. We don't belong together. You like all this crap that's stupid. I like good stuff like metal. What does he do instead of that? Yeah. I think that he is incredulous <coughs> that he thinks that there's just something they're not getting and if he could only understand that, he keeps repeating, if I can only understand where they're coming from, because he's just so astounded that this is the situation that he's in or where he finds himself and uh, he really can't believe it because I think a couple of times it kept saying his first reaction would have been to say, you know, like, what are you, crazy? And, yeah, he bites his tongue and he gets tired. Like, he, he keeps getting tired and exhausted. And, you know, he just, this whole thing is just so heavy for him that they're not happy for his achievement. Yeah, so there are two, two things here, right? One is he's really trying to understand them. And when he has a visceral negative reaction to them, he checks it. And says, you know, I'm not sure this is fair. Maybe this is coming from a place of um, missing me or this or that. He tries to put a, a different spin on it. And he, he says, I don't, I don't understand them. And he's trying to understand them. And we see a few places where he really makes an effort to do that. And there are two parts of that. One is checking reactions of his that uh, are coming from an assumption about where they're coming from. And he's not sure it's right. And, so he's, and the other is just looking into it. But the other thing that I think also he does, which is striking, is all, he recognizes that they have different things they care about than he does. And he makes a real effort to make allowances for that. Right? He thinks, you know, I don't care about friends of local, global progress, but Philip does. So why don't I try to help Philip out by doing something for friends of global progress? It doesn't mean anything to me, but it means something to him. And so it'll make him happy. I'd like to. I'd like to make him happy. And likewise, later when we'll talk about uh, with Lillian, right? Um, Lillian wants to throw this party. He doesn't care for parties. He doesn't want to throw a party. But he thinks um, it's her form of celebrating uh, our relationship. I don't know if I want that, but it's something she's doing in good faith. I'll have to defer to her standards on this. And then you can see Reardon's house. He doesn't like it. Right? He doesn't like the way it's decorated. But he accepts, well, it must presumably it's decorated by Lillian or someone, not him, since he doesn't like the way it's decorated. He, when he sees that his family members have different standards than him, he tries to see their side of it. If he can't see their side of it, he'll at least some of the time defer to them. Um, on the other hand, he doesn't defer to them so much that he gets home on time to have dinner with them. Uh, so he defers to them, and yet it's... He either resents it and then tries to stop himself from resenting it, or right? he's in some kind of conflict here. Uh, Robert, you wanted to say something? Yeah, you mentioned the, the proper word in your last description. It's his house. It's uh -huh. not his home. He doesn't live in a home. It's a house. And that makes, you know, she makes that description very clear. Yeah, that's a good point. We distinguish between a house and a home, and it's not a home to him. It's some place he comes house to. <laughs> he comes back to at the end of the day. House of which Howard Rourke would disapprove. But he, he actually compares it to a naked woman. The house. His house. Right? The not, shame. not one who should be Nudity yeah. not worth revealing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the house is described, the aesthetics of the house are in terms that uh, seem counter to Rand's own as well as to Reardon's. 
Um, Ed mentions that Howard Bork, the protagonist of The Fountainhead, uh, has choice things to say about this kind of house in that novel. And, uh, you know, we don't know that Reardon's the same person as Bork, but uh, it seems like it doesn't fit at all with, uh, with, with Rand's aesthetic, at least. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, about Lillian. Um, Mary Ann, who had a really nice post on this chapter, asking, uh, answering some of the questions that were posed and made a lot of good observations, pointed out something interesting about Lillian's first introduction. And I think the first introductions to characters tell us a lot. Uh, our first introduction of Eddie has him uh, kind of bewildered and uneasy at a world that uh, is going wrong in a way he can't understand. And I think that's a lot of what we'll see of Eddie's character going on. Our first uh, introduction to Daphne has her um, in this exaltation over this music, right, and giving in to this exaltation in a way that implies that this is unusual to her. Um, and our first introduction to Reardon has him expressionless and alone looking at his greatest achievement finally being fulfilled and wondering why the great happiness that comes with this uh, feels lonely. So what's our introduction to Lillian? Carrie Ann? We actually are introduced to her before we meet her physically. That's true, yeah. It's a, it comes in a contrast with Reardon's thinking about giving the chain to his wife, in quotation marks, not the woman to whom he's married. He feels regret for thinking of it that way, uh, thinking of the fact that he's giving the chain to the woman and not his wife in the abstract, and then a wave of self-reproach for the regret. So we already get this complicated psychological pretzel dynamic he <laughs> has toward the woman who is his wife, for whom he made the chain that means so much. Uh, and we already get a sense that this is not a good fit. So when we, we're, pre we're pre-prepared to meet her in person uh, in this very ambiguous way. Good. So our very first introduction to her is by way of Reardon's thoughts. He has made a chain to celebrate this achievement for his wife, and then he's taken aback. Um, I made it for, quote, my wife, the person who holds that role, not for Lillian. Uh, and then he feels bad about that, and then he feels bad for feeling bad about it, so we get this uh, uh, complication. But then when we actually do meet her, what, uh, what happens? He walks in the door and what? Does anyone remember? She ignores him. She doesn't even her a yeah. yeah, she ignores him or seemingly ignores him. Or what he can't tell if she's noticed him coming in because she continues her sentence. But her sentence that she continues is a kind of dig on you. An enlightened person simply can't be excited about plumbing or whatever. And she's going on in this, um, you know, what uh, I think is intended to be a pompous manner. Uh, and in any case, a manner that's demeaning to Reardon's values. And then she turns to Henry brightly and says, you know, isn't it too early to be home, dear, when he's coming home late? Which indicates that she must have been aware of him all the time. So it's seeming like we're introduced to her through a little bit of artifice on her part, right? Henry comes in. She pretends not to notice that he's come in. She continues saying something, maybe veers towards the nasty to him in the saying of it, and then turns to him as though she's just noticing him and... Um, makes a kind of pleasant, maybe intended to be pleasant, it's unclear, but a, a kind of joking remark about his being late that's making light of it. Um, so what, what uh, Marianne noticed is that um, it's a first indicator of, his mani of her mani as manipulative. She ignores his entrance and then, of course, uh, modifies her behavior in accordance with the fact that he's entering, but doesn't initially acknowledge it. I also found it interesting that um, he describes her as two, her arms look like two swans. I mean, I don't think those are known to be like the brightest animals in the world. And he's literally like comparing her to just a physical thing and sort of trivial, trivializing her. So yeah, either Rand or maybe Reardon in his internal monologue describes her arms as looking like two swans. That, that, that stood out to me, too, as a description. 
Um, you're suggesting that maybe it's a, it's a liking her to something stupid because swans aren't too smart. That's not how I interpret it. I'm not. I mean, swans are symbols of elegance, and uh, so I, I think it's meant to show her as, or at least I initially thought it's meant to show her as, um, yeah, graceful or in an exaggerated way graceful. Um, like, you know, a swan is a graceful thing, but your arms looking like two swans would be a kind of um, harlequin pastiche of grace or something. Uh, but I'm not sure exactly, and it's a little hard to picture what someone's arms looking like two swans would look like. Um, what in general is Lillian's role towards Reardon in this family discussion? Yeah, Mohammed? So, where his mom and his uh, brother are uh, speaks to him in a in type of, you know, they actually explicitly blame him. Mm -hmm. uh, Lillian appears to, uh, it's kind of like a double-edged sword type of strategy where she says, oh, it's fine, well, he can't help it. Um, when he comes in, she says, oh, you know, he's still at the mills. You know, uh, kind of throwing these, again, these under undercover jabs at him that appear first to be um, a type of support, whereas his mother is more fierce. But when you look more into it, um, there's also a hint of resentment uh, that you can sense from her. Yeah, so she is often defending him to the other members of his family. And yet, uh, and she's making light of the fact that he came in late in a way where they're upset about it. She's saying, oh, well, what do you expect from Henry? And don't get all up on Henry too soon. He's still at the mills and he's not fully here yet. And so there's a respect in which she seems to be playing the role of his champion or defender or being sweet to him. And yet there's a biting undertone to it. Or, oh, mother, you say um, I had something important to discuss and Henry's wrong to come home late when I had something so important to discuss. But it's not important, not to Henry. You know, uh, it's of no importance at all. It's strictly non-business. There's a kind of, uh, there's the expression of damning someone by faint praise. And I get the sense that Lillian is, you know, undermining by faint defense or something like that. So there's an undermining quality. Um, a lot of people on the chat said that what she was is passive aggressive. And that, that um, I think, probably was less of a phrase in 1957 than it's become since, but seems apt of her. Uh, Al? Yeah, uh, are we allowed to discuss chapter titles at this point? I'd like to get to the chapter title just at the end of today rather okay. than now. Uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll talk around the chapter title. Okay. One of the things that occurs to me is. How did this extremely intelligent, productive, good guy end up surrounded by really lousy, parasitic people? There are at least people who he doesn't have anything in common with, who are financially living off him, uh, including now his mother is an old lady and probably supported him, maybe supported him in his youth, so maybe we, don't, maybe we shouldn't blame her for that. But um, Philip... Uh, it seems like he's not done anything with his life, right? Um, and, you know, why is he with these people? Uh, and also, his question, though, is, is why are they with him? Why do they want to hold him? And it doesn't seem like the whole answer is money. Uh, we'll learn more about them and their motives later, but I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Lillian was independently wealthy before, not as rich as he was, but independently wealthy before she married him. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe Philip is just sponging off him, I don't know. Let's, um, two other points I'd like to talk about about Lillian, and then, and then I think we should talk about the other member of the, who's not a member of the household, but who's there, which is Paul Larkin. Um, so, two thoughts on Lillian. I mean, first, what happens with the, with the anniversary party? How do we understand this, this event? So, the mother says, um, you know, Lillian had something very important to discuss with you. Then she says, oh, no, no, it's not very important. It's just a, uh, it's, after all, it's got nothing to do with business. Uh, so, it's not important at all. And she says it in a way that Reardon thinks almost sounds like a boast or an insult, which is interesting. Um, like, it's not the kind of thing Henry cares about in a way that's kind of a dig on him, maybe. But then 
she says she's throwing a party. She wants him to come. Uh, can can he make a point to be there? And he says, you know, well, I don't know where I'm going to be months from now. How can I do it? And she says, well, but I, you make business appointments and you keep them way in advance. And that, you know, seems like a fair point. When things are important to him, he's able to be somewhere months away from now. And the fact is the party's not important to him and she's asking him to make it. Um, uh, I'll let you pick the date to your convenience. I have a certain date in mind. Uh, but if another one would be better, and she throws out the date, I think it's December 10th. Uh, and he says, I don't care. You know, doesn't mean anything to me. And she says, you know, Henry, that's the date of our wedding anniversary. So what's going on here? Even prior to this, he feels like she's acting as though she has some kind of weird trump card over him. She's obviously knew it was the date of the wedding anniversary and was withholding that, and maybe she's trying to embarrass him. Or What's going on here? What is she doing, and what's his reaction to it? Any thoughts? She trapped him. She's trapped him, you she said. She trapped him. She knew that he wasn't going to remember the anniversary, so she set him up. She set him up. She knew he wasn't going to remember the anniversary. He knows that she set him up in a way. What's his reaction? Does he feel guilty, or how does he feel? Muhammad says amused. Resigned. Resigned. Amusement is the look they see on his face. But he, he also says in his mind, he, he didn't think she could have intended it as a trap. So he, the very obvious intention she seems to have of manipulating him to a trap, he denies that possibility and tries to fabricate an alternative intention that's much more benevolent than the one she in fact had. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he knows that if by a trap we just mean that um, she withheld the fact that it was their anniversary I until later and she wanted to, um, in some sense, catch him unawares, I don't think he's denying that she did that. But he has a... I know we should look at the scene and see because I might be wrong about that. But he, he puts a very benevolent spin on it. Um, he could say... I mean, what he's thinking is he could say, yeah, I don't give a crap about our anniversary. You know, I don't care about it, which is what, in effect, she's implying about him. And uh, it would be his way of saying, I don't care about you. And I think um, what he's saying is, what he's thinking is, she put herself in a situation where he could do that because she wanted to make herself vulnerable to him, to go out on a limb and express in this way that she does mean something to him, like give her the opportunity to hurt her. And so he's not going to take that opportunity because he uh, it respects her having made this bold gesture or something like that? Yes, but by the end of the scene, when he actually assumes the benevolent interpretation and acts accordingly and doesn't get all angry, she seems disappointed that he responded that way. So she has this mis mysterious quality it seems to be disappointed that he responded as well as he did instead of uh, waving it off as unimportant. Yeah, and not to carry on saying, yeah, so he does take it that way and react that way, but she seems disappointed that he did. So yeah, I think that's right. So she is trying to trap him. Uh, he has a certain interpretation that's very benevolent of what she's trying to accomplish in doing this. Um, he acts and responds in light of that interpretation. Uh, we get some evidence that that's not a welcome response of hers. Maybe it's because she thinks it's disingenuous and she, um, or maybe it's because there's something darker going on there. Uh, but notice what the, the trap is something where he could so easily hurt her by just owning the thing that she's claiming is true of him, that he doesn't really love her. And um, because that's the case, he's not willing to do it. She's put herself up where all he has to do is say, yeah, you're right, I don't love you, I don't care about our anniversary, that's why I don't remember it, and to hell with our anniversary. And she would have, she's in effect accusing him of that. And uh, instead he in effect takes the conciliatory tone and apologizes as though it's bad rather than something that he's going to own the attitude that she attributes to him because uh, he thinks he shouldn't 
right? He shouldn't be indifferent to his wife and not care about her. And her um, challenging him as to whether he is is maybe her way of going out on a limb and saying that she still loves him and giving him the chance to uh, to uh, respect that love or something or maybe show that he cares about her too. And yet it doesn't seem like she's really reassured or happy with his response. It seems like... Hmm. One other aspect of Lillian... Um, I forget whether it's Lily. We have to, have to look back at the chapter. Either uh, his mother, Reardon's mother, or Philip says that you know there's no use in trying to get Henry to be a saint. He'll never be a saint. This is after Henry gives the money to Philip, and Philip asks for it in cash and so forth. And um, maybe we'll come back to that at the end. And go ahead. It is indeed uh, Philip uh, who says it's no use hoping to make a saint out of Henry. Mother, then he's speaking to his mother. Um, William jumps in and says, and then she says, um, "Oh, but Philip, you're wrong. Uh, you're so wrong. Henry has all the makings of the saint, of the saint, and that's the trouble." Yeah. So Henry has all. So Lillian has a different perspective on Reardon than his family, the, than his birth family, whatever. Um, his mother and Philip think. He's selfish. He's not someone who cares about moral things. He's not a saint. And Lillian thinks there's, in some respect, in which he's a saint, and that's a problem. And we don't really have enough yet to go on to know what that is here. But it is interesting that we see Reardon showing a real concern for doing the right and just thing in all his dealings with them. Um, all throughout this chapter, so every time he wants to strike back and insult them, or or, or or he's disgusted by something that he initially interpreted as certain way, he think, is this a just reaction? Is this the right way to be with them? And if not, he's not gonna gonna be that way. Um, okay, um, let's um, um, Binyam on the on the um, on the Facebook group said that this shows that she understands him in a way that they don't. And I think there's something to that, right? He does have a kind of concern with what's right and wrong that's really serious to him and that's governing how he's dealing in these situations. And Lillian's alert to that in a way that it's not clear that uh, Philip or Reardon's mother are. Yet Lillian still does have some kind of contempt for him. She has contempt for the things he cares about. She says they're not, they're all commercial and material and like plumbing and stuff. She's uh, on about him for being so materialistic. All right. Uh, I'm still hoping Ben can come back in at some point because he had a lot of good points about these things. Ben, I can't hear you if you're talking now. I think you have your mic muted, Ben. All right, well. You're talking on my phone now. Um, all right, so I will continue. There are a few... Your connection's bad. All right, we'll just have to... Uh, I'll just have to forge ahead then. Where where are we? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about Paul Larkin. What's this guy doing there? He's the only one who's not related to Reardon by marriage or blood. Are there any other things that are distinctive about Larkin's role in the house? Seems to be a hanger-on. Seems to be a hanger-on. Not a really bad guy because he takes out loans from Reardon and pays them back late, but at least he pays them back. So Yeah, and they're not huge loans. But he seems to be tapped into the guy in Washington, and he's trying to warn Reardon about some danger. Okay, so... But in a vague, sort of an undefined manner. All right, so Ed's saying he's not a, a bad guy, but he does seem to be some kind of, or at least he's not too bad a guy, but he seems to be some kind of a hanger-on. He points out that he's trying to warn him about something, but, but vaguely. Um, let's step back, though, and think more generally what's his relation to Reardon, and then we'll come...
I think is really striking which he's different from Reardon family. Uh, to this, he, yeah, he admires Reardon. At the very least, he doesn't put him down, right? Uh, either there's no, he says, you know, people, whatever, forget what they're saying about it. Reardon Madden's a great product. Uh, like everything else you do, Hank, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, there's no, we don't get any of this kind of undermining uh, of Hank from, from him. Uh, he's not condescending or snot. Now, he does try to give him some business advice that's not exactly welcome, but he does it in a, in a relatively respectful way. He says, you know how much I admire you, Hank. I think this is something you've got to be worried about. And, um, and when Reardon does, uh, there's one point at which I think he really comes, one sign that he's really, in a way, rooting for Reardon. Uh, Reardon does something we haven't talked about yet with Philip, right? What, is, what does he do with Philip? $10,000. Yeah, so Philip's got some agency, Friends of Global Progress, that he's working for, some organization, and Reardon doesn't know what, what it is, but Philip kind of hints around about uh, that he's you know, looking for money from it and all these bloated money bags, no one will give him any money. All he's trying to do is raise $10,000, and Reardon writes him a check, and then Philip says... Yeah, you know, can you give it to us in cash? Because we don't want your name associated with our progressive cause that always cites you with one of the blackest marks of whatever. And Reardon says, yeah, all right, you could have it in cash. And Larkin, like Gills, why, why did you do that? Right? This, Larkin's taking Reardon's side in this. He's thinking, this is crazy. You're giving. Now, it might be that Larkin knows more about Friends of Global Progress than Reardon does. I don't know. Reardon doesn't know anything about them except. They give free lectures on cooperative farming or something. Um, but I guess by this time, Lark, they all know that they hate Reardon since they go on talking about how he's a black figure and such. Um, but Larkin's like thinking, what, what are you doing, Reardon? You know, why are you giving money to this, off, this group that hates you that you're, just because your uh, you know, brother wants it? Um, so, I mean, I think there's some evidence that he's, you know, got actual respect for Reardon. He's, in some sense, rooting for him or on his side. Um, why, then, is Reardon, who's lonely, who in some sense is lonely, in some sense is looking for someone to acknowledge and bond with him over his achievement, uh, why isn't Larkin a great boon to him? I mean, why, why doesn't Larkin lighten his mood much? He doesn't seem to hate Larkin. Indeed, he kind of speaks off the top of his head with Larkin kind of much more freely than with his family member. He thinks out loud to Larkin. So he, in some sense, he's more comfortable with him than with his family members. And yet, it doesn't seem like Larkin's presence is a plus to him on this evening. Any thoughts? Al? Yeah, um, he doesn't consider Larkin an equal. And in, related to that, Larkin uh, makes him feel responsible <laughs> Uh, where he says that he's watching Larkin's efforts, and then it's so hard for him, for Reardon, and so easy for me. It suggests that Reardon has a responsibility to help. And yeah, so he says he doesn't respect Larkin. He indeed, in some sense, feels responsible for him. Um, I don't know. I don't. I guess he might. He, he certainly is inclined to help him because he sees that Larkin has a hard time at things that are easy for Reardon. He's described as having the feeling he sees when an ant labors carrying a matchstick. So it's um, he thinks Larkin's pathetic, right? I mean, he thinks Larkin's well-meaning, uh, and he he you know wishes Larkin well and so forth, and wants to help in ways he can, but. He doesn't really respect the guy, it seems. And indeed, you can see that in the little conversation they have. Larkin's impressing on him the need to have a good man in Washington and so forth, and to think more about maybe that aspect of his business than, than he does. Uh, and Reardon says, you know, well, but I don't know, Paul, the, the, the men you have to choose for, for for that job are such a crummy lot. And Larkin says, you know, well, what are you going to do? That's the way it is. And Reardon says, well, I don't see why it's got to be that way. Why should that be? And what's Larkin's response? Who is John Galt? Who is John Galt? It's our only, our only occurrence of that question in this chapter. Reardon's response is interesting to the who is John Galt question. Does anyone remember it? No. Um, 
He said he, he, he gets angry and he, he starts thinking about his business again and stops being exhausted. Does he get angry? He does no, stop he being exhausted. He said, well, I thought the no that he says in response was to, we're not going to settle for that. Yeah. He says, as I recall, no, there's no reason to feel that way. So, so he interprets the who is John Galt question as a kind of resignation or defeatism or something. And I don't know that he's angry at Larkin in particular, but he's, he's got a no, no, not like that. And I'm not, you know, you can, we don't get the tone of voice of his no, so we've got to figure it in. But it's like, go ahead. Just, he, says, he says sharply. Sharply. No, he said sharply. Okay. Sharply, no. <laughs> Good. So he's rejecting the kind of attitude or view of life that goes with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's, again, not someone who we view as a peer, someone who, when faced with a problem in business, their response is, well, you know, it is what it is, uh, not how can it be made better. Yeah. So why is Larkin there? Ed kind of indicated something about this earlier. We're told uh, he tells us that he's there to ask Reardon about his Washington man, right? How's your Washington man? Uh, are you sure he's okay? And he says, that's the reason why I came, in fact. This is important. The implication is that he's gotten wind of something going on. We're not, it, it isn't divulged in the scene, but, but the implication is that you better watch out. That sounds right. Because, and what's the evidence of that in the chapter? I think it's a few, he feels a duty to go there, right? He says, this is important. This is why I came. You don't take a train out to someone to just generally tell them something, right? And Reardon says, any particular reason. And he thinks about it for a moment, decides the duty is discharged, and says no. And so that really strongly implies there is some particular reason. Larkin knows something he's not telling Reardon to do with his Washington man. And uh, he thinks he ought to, he has some kind of obligation to him because of their friendship or the help Reardon's given him to push Reardon to think about the Washington man, but it doesn't extend to actually sharing what, whatever it is that he knows. And that's a problem. And that's a problem. Because, yeah, what, what does he have to hide? In other words, there must be some connection between Larkin and this other guy, so he's telling stories out of school, so to speak. He's obliged to do it, but he's not going all the way. He right. obviously knows something. And he's yeah. not telling Reardon what it is. So we have reason to be suspicious of Larkin. He's in on something or he has some background information. So we'll, we'll get to see about this, you know, soon as we go forward. Uh, so Larkin, yeah, if we think that, if we think Larkin's definitely holding something back on Reardon. We don't know just what it is or... or Maybe he would be betraying a confidence and it would be wrong for him to tell. We don't know yet, but depending on what you think it is, it puts Larkin in a somewhat different light. If he's someone who's um, in cahoots with someone or something and won't tell Reardon about it is, uh, is how Ed's suggesting, interpreting it. Yeah? Um, do you see any like foreshadowing, though, of the way that Eddie Larkin talks? Well, we can't talk too much about foreshadowing because... To talk about foreshadowing, we'd have to know what's coming forward, and we're trying not to get ahead of ourselves. Um, Just the vagueness. But there is a vagueness to him, and there is a kind of pathetic quality to Larkin. Uh, Mohammed? Yeah, um, the vagueness comes from not speaking directly, and in a manner that Reardon is not used to. Um, so he says, um, so... Um, Paul Larkin sighs, and then uh, Reardon says, what's the matter, Paul? What are you driving at? Like, he senses there's a message that's not being relayed. Uh, and then Paul says, nothing, you know, nothing in particular. Only one never knows what's, what can happen in times like these. One has to be careful. Uh, these, these types of encrypted messages where you have to read in between the lines mm -hmm. adds to his uh, vagueness and kind of makes him seem like a more shifty character was before he was kind of like someone who's admired here, but now he's kind of like kind of shady on him. Kind of makes me wonder why Reardon doesn't take him up on it and say, what are you getting at? Hmm. But Reardon doesn't care for this Washington scene. Yeah, I mean, probably you... probably doesn't give it too much credence or, or importance. You could interpret... So 
probably missing some point. You could interpret Larkin as um, being shifty and evasive. Uh, it also might be he's described as this kind of nervous guy who's like, you know, a turtle who wants to retreat into his shell, but he doesn't have one, so instead he has this kind of grin, you know, that he retreats into. Uh, so it might be that just he's he's someone who doesn't who's vague because he's scared to be too definite, um, even when he doesn't have anything to hide. Although if he has something to hide, all the, the more so. It is interesting about Reardon, who, who is shown as so thoughtful about every aspect of his business, right, that he has trouble motivating himself to think much about this aspect of his business. And um, he, tells, he tells Paul why it is. It's like the, the, all the people you have to choose are so bad. Um, and he sees that as a problem to be solved, and yet he's, he's not, he hasn't solved it. And um, he's not, I guess, trying his best to solve it either. So that's an interesting, um, interesting uh, side of, of Reardon. Okay, so we are at 9.50. I think we can go a little bit past 10 to deal with technical difficulties, but I feel um, sad not to have... Uh, not to have Ben here, who was going to be uh, saying some of these points and also connecting us with the online audience. Is anybody here, does anybody here have up the Facebook live feed? I uh, don't have the audio on, but does anybody have where they can see what comments are coming across? Robert? Well, Richard Sullivan says, Larkin seems to have bad political news for Hank, but, doesn't, but now doesn't want to deliver it. Realizing Hank feels good about his new medal. Hmm. So, so he's saying uh, Richard Salzman is saying. Well, you guys can read it since you're on Facebook Live Land as well. That uh, he has bad political news for Hank, but doesn't want to deliver it. That seems right. Um, Richard suggesting the reason for that might be because he sees Hank's reassured about weird metal, and so maybe he doesn't need to hear it now. Um, that could be. Uh, I don't recall anything in particular that prompted me to think that was the reason, but. Um, but it could be. Um, and I have a, a couple of questions that came up that came up online that I think we, we can spend a little bit of time on. So one actually came up last week in the spoilers group. Actually, before that, just one other thing I think we should observe, and maybe people will take it up uh, on Facebook if, they don't, if we don't talk about it much here. But why does Reardon give Phil up the money, the $10,000? to seem happy because that might make him happy. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a day to celebrate. Reardon met Yeah, it's a day to celebrate and he, Reardon, had said that um, happiness is an agent of purification and this will make Reardon, this will make uh, Philip happy, at least by all indications, so he gives him the money. Uh, you can think of it, uh, Ben posed it as, a, as it's an experiment in a way that tests his hypothesis that happiness is an agent of purification. Um, what's the re if you think of it as an experiment, what's the result of the experiment? What happens? It's a failure. Yeah, yeah. It's a failure. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't seem happy afterwards. And what's the effect of that on Reardon? Does anyone have that paragraph near to hand? Reardon's crestfallen. Reardon's crestfallen, yeah. How, what does it say about him? Reardon could not understand his own feeling. It was as if something leaden and empty were collapsing within him. He felt both the weight and the emptiness together. He knew it was disappointment, but he wondered why it was so gray and ugly. Yeah, so Reardon has a really deep negative reaction to the fact that his brother reacts this way when he gives him this money. He expects it'll make him happy. It'll shock Philip out of his kind of um, way that he is, which Reardon sees as dreary, and it doesn't. Uh, he's kind of nasty about it and, uh, and at, at best indifferent to getting it. And, uh, but Reardon's not like, oh, well, that doesn't work. He, something really, it really hits Reardon like a ton of bricks. And it's worth, let's not pause now over it here, because there are some other issues to get onto, but let's notice that. And for people uh, who want to discuss it further in the Facebook, I think that's interesting. Why does Reardon have such a, a strong reaction to this? All right. Um, that said, here's a question that came up on Facebook Live. And, and Robert, or if anyone else who's looking at it, tell me you know, what other reactions we're getting there. And if people are raising things they'd like us to address. 
or if any of you guys have things you'd like to talk about that haven't come up yet, um, let us know. What? You, you've got one. I have a side one. Do you think Paul Larkin was on the train in the first scene? The tagger train that, uh, huh. that describes? So Robert asks, do we think uh, Paul Larkin was on the train that's passing by earlier in the first scene? Something. Yeah, it's he says time. he's on a certain train. Uh, we're not told what time it is, so it could have been that train. Um, I don't know. What would be the significance if it turns out he was on the train? It's not relevant, is it? Well, it's a Taggart train, and he took the train. and it's described, So it could be through his eyes he's seeing all of this achievement. You're seeing that it could be narrated through his eyes. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. It would be relevant because the passengers watched them idly without interest. Um, well, that was just before, and then they get to the, the buildings, and, and then the passengers could not grasp the complexity of what seemed to be a city stretched for miles, active without sign of human presence. And, and then, then there's the conversation of the professor of economics. So, I mean, it, I don't know, because Paul Larkin at least seems to recognize that Hank Reardon did achieve something. But it's, it's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, the group... The paid no attention. One more heat of steel being formed was not an event that they should they have been taught to notice. So can you put Larkin in with that? Can you imagine? Kind of? Yeah, the group of passengers don't care. and They're not interested in Reardon steel and they're not interested in what turns out to be the first heat of Reardon metal. So if Paul Larkin's among them, then he's someone who doesn't care. But, um, and he could be, but it's not like we're told none of the passengers care. Like We're not given some, some sentence that would really give us a very strong view of him when he's there, and we're told about some of the other ones. But it never occurred to me that he might be. So uh, there's a thought and something, something to reflect on. One issue that came up on Facebook earlier that I just thought it's worth saying something about, it came up in the spoilers section, but it's not really a spoiler, is um, is it the case that all the positive characters are good-looking and the negative characters bad-looking? And if so, why is that? And is that kind of weird? Or well, What do we think of that? Any thoughts? Well, at first glance, it was an uh, attractive woman until you looked into her eyes. So Lillian Reardon's attractive until you look into her eyes. Uh, Iris? Uh, it's something I remember from, I think, high school. Harry might know of it, uh, that some of the ancient Greeks talked about the fact that in their plays, uh, the two handsomest uh, men, man and woman were always the heroes who would marry, and uh, that, it, that that style was used to give us information about them. So there's the idea that it, as a literary device, we might be being cued up to who's good and who's bad by whether they're handsome or not. Um, I mean, one, there are a few issues I think go under this heading. It's not clear whether the, the characters Rand's sympathetic to really are handsomer. Um, they're described in a more sympathetic way, but Reardon is said, you know, everyone's always told him he's ugly, and he's got these lines in his face. What they have is, is facial features that convey a certain kind of character that, or suggest it, that the author or the character who's, who we're, whose thoughts we're seeing them narrated about has a, a, a certain slant on. But it's not always positive. Like, we get Dadney described at one point through James's view of her, and it's negative, like nothing could give her the charm of a soft focus, and the fact that she has nice legs spoils his estimate of her. Um, it is true, though, that the characters Rand's sympathetic to have a similar look to one another, which we can gather that Rand liked. They tend to be light-haired, not exclusively, but typically, and, and pale-skinned. They tend to be kind of northern and western European-looking. Um, I think that's just because... And they tend to be very slim, yeah. Now, I think that's because she has a child growing up in Soviet Russia, or in Russia, and then Soviet Russia, Tsarist and then Soviet Russia, romanticized England and France and the West. And we, There are some stories in her uh, autobiographical interviews she gave about her, her symbols of what she wanted out of life and English people and American people and were these kind of symbols to her. So I think just the, a look that she associates with, you wouldn't see this kind of look in Russia, 
is something that she romanticizes, and so when she imagines heroes, they're like that. As for the the seeming ugliness of the villains, I mean, is it true that they're ugly? Not not ugly like if you see them, you're like, oh my god. But someone like um, I don't want to call him a villain, but someone who's not definitely a hero in the book, so like it was a Paul Lark. Um, the body stature that you, you could, that you could assume he has is one where he's not really that confident, um, kind of angst, uh, angst type of person. So it's not. I don't. I don't hear her describe anyone as just like tremendously ugly. So if you look at him, you think, "Oh my God, what?" No, but they they don't have the body types of someone you would assume would be confident. Yeah, there's, there's also, I mean, it's a little bit hard to separate bodily features from personality features sometimes. I mean, if you, you can probably get an actor to portray this, Paul Larkin seems like he can retreat into his shell thing by making his face and his shoulders and his posture a certain way, and the same actor might stand in a very different way in the next scene and just look quite different. A lot of the things that you might think of as physical traits are ways of bearing or ways of holding themselves. The the person who pointed this out in the spoilers group and who was interested in this was uh, writing about James Taggart. And uh, of the things that we're told about James Taggart, um, the only one that's like, he's balding. All right, he probably couldn't, probably doesn't have too much to do with his character. Um, uh, at least I hope it does not assign a bad character because... Uh, uh, but he, yeah, but the other ones are he slouches, he's, um, it's said that he has a body that's intended for a certain kind of use, and yet it's not in his case being used that way. So there's a lot of, you know, posture, how the person carries themselves, how the person moves, which isn't exactly a physical thing. And even Lillian, um, who's described as beautiful but then disappointing because it's something about her eyes, it's not clear whether the flaw is some biological thing that her eyes are a murky color, or it's, it's the way she looks, maybe. That's the way she looks what's, out at the world. But the, what's behind the eyes? I think she had a choice. In other words, the, the eyes are vacuous or empty or whatever. But Philip is described in the same manner as, as uh, James. Yeah. In, in, a, in a sense, I mean, not the same, but in a similar manner. Well, he's described he, he's, as he's, long, he's having a normal... He would have been a normal looking individual. He's but described he's as having a long and lanky, but a loose and lanky body. Which is good, like, like Hank. Yeah, now Hank is like described as being very slender and gaunt, but... I've never found anything wrong, you know, he has the, 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 the visual appearance of, of being sickly, let's say. Right? Mm -hmm. not. It's just his attitude is the fact that he's a wastrel. Yeah, so good. So, so Reardon is described in positive terms that have to do with being slender. And uh, Philip is described in more negative sounding terms that have to do with being slender. They're probably both slender guys, but Reardon's got a, a you know, upright positive posture and Philip just kind of mopes around. Um, now Philip is, always seems to be in ill health, but then as Ed points out, the doctors could never find anything wrong with him. So it sounds like he's just like some kind of hypochondriac or something. Um, all right, so that's uh, our physiognomy question. Um, yeah, Robert has a question. Number four, where you where you're comparing Dagny and Ridden. Uh huh. There's one there's one word that's used in both of their descriptions when they're trying to figure out something. Mm -hmm. um, Ridden says, "Don't start imagining the insane when he's thinking about his family." And in the prior chapter, Dagny was. If she, if he were insane, when she's thinking about Jim Taggart, that he hates Reardon because he's he's good. So the term insane is in both of their psyches for something they can't figure out. Um, they can't get condemned because they don't understand, which is how how uh, Ayman describes describes Reardon. But it's an interesting term that she's using in for for both of them. Yeah, that's a really good point. So both Daphne and Reardon have certain thoughts about what might be going on with someone else, someone in their family, and they dismiss the thought as, you know, you have to be insane to think this is possible. Do you remember what it was in each case? Well, this one was, he, he's thinking about his family, uh -huh. okay, that um, 
don't start imagining the insane, he told himself, uh, struggling. Right. Yes. But what, what is it that um, would be insane for him to imagine? It's almost as if his family would be wounded by his mere existence. Good. So his family always seems hurt. Yeah. What is it that they're hurt by? Something he does? Not anything specific, it seems. It's almost as if what they're hurt by is the mere fact that he exists. So that thought occurs to Reardon, and then he dismisses it as that would be crazy. And what's the thought that occurs? It's not what he does. It's what he is. Good. Yeah. Not that he exists. It's, it's what he exists as, that, you know, an exemplary person. So Ed suggesting that it's it's not just the fact that there's some guy that exists, it's that he's the kind of person he is, and Ed says an exemplary person, that's the issue. C carry on? Uh, and in Dagny's case, uh, this the exact sentence, she would, it, if, she, if she were insane, thought Dagny, she would conclude that her brother hated to deal with Reardon because Reardon did his job with superlative efficiency, but she would not conclude it. Right. So interestingly, they both have to do with ways people might view Reardon. Yeah. Uh, Reardon's family might be hurt by the very fact that he exists, or maybe, as Ed says, the fact that he exists as the kind of person he is. Um, what Dagny represent, rejects as insane is that she knows Jim is like really hates Hank for some reason, and she doesn't know why, and if she was insane, she would conclude it's because he's so good at his job. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. They both have this thought. They both reject it. What would it, it's both a thought about their family members and their family members' negative attitude towards Reardon. It was a really good observation. So let's close just by talking for a few minutes about the title. The title of the chapter is The Chain. Obviously, at one level, it refers to this chain that Reardon makes and gives to Lillian. Uh, any other resonances of the chapter? I mean, Lillian talks about it a bit at the end. Al? Yeah, well, the very end talking about uh, chain appropriate, isn't it? Uh, he holds us all in bondage. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but I think it wouldn't be a spoiler to talk about you know, general knowledge of economics, that it's a fallacy to say that the wealthy hold people in bondage by, by being kind to them and giving them money. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little unclear even what in the chapter she's talking about. But she says, what would become of his strengths if he didn't have uh, these weaker people around? And what would be if he didn't... Uh, what does anyone... Can you read the lines right before that, uh, Al, if, you, if, you have, if you're open to it already? Uh, where? It's the last page. The last it's the last page. Then Lillian's oh, yeah. voice came cold and gay. But you're wrong, Cole. You're so wrong. What would happen to Henry's vanity if he didn't have us to throw arms to him? What would become of his strength if he didn't have weaker people to dominate? What would he do with himself if he didn't keep us around as dependents? It's quite all right, really. I'm not criticizing him. It's just a law of human nature. She took the metal bracelet and held it up, letting it glitter in the lamplight. A chain, she said, appropriate, isn't it? It's the chain by which he holds us all in bondage. So Paul, recall, is objecting to the fact that Reardon gave this $10,000 to his brother and then let his brother take it in cash because he didn't want his name to be, or rather, his brother's organization, the Friends of Global Progress. Um, and Paul says, you shouldn't have, Hank. And then Lillian says, no, he, he, you're wrong, Paul. He, Reardon needs this. He needs to do stuff like this. Because what would be the good of his strength if he couldn't dominate? And what would be the good of his um, vision if he couldn't, you know, show us in effect that we depend on him? Uh, or throw alms to us or something. That's what... Reardon needs that. He needs them. And it's unclear why they need him on this picture. I guess because it's true that they require Reardon's strength. Um, the Lillian isn't really explicit about that. Because you'd think that would, if his strengths require someone else to dominate, then that would be a chain, it sounds like it would be a chain by which they hold him, rather than a chain by which he holds them. But she says it's the chain by which he holds us. A little unclear what exactly Lillian's view is here. Robert, do you have a thought on that? No, I was, I was just going to say, psychologically, they have the chain over him. He might have economically, but he's not using it, because psychologically, they, they are dominating him in, in, in too many senses uh, hmm. on the personal side. Go ahead. Yeah, I yeah. think it's like a quote from The Fountainhead. Maybe I'm spoiling, but I, I hope nobody 
we're well, we, uh, concerned that uh, a leash is just a noose. Uh, or a rope with a noose at both ends. So to dominate somebody is to get dominated in turn by them. And so maybe the idea is that Hank, by trying to dominate his family in this way that Lillian thinks, gets dominated by them in turn. Interestingly, maybe that's the idea that she has. I don't know if I totally agree that Hank is such a willing... Because he, he talks about his mother and he says, I don't know why my mother lives with me. Good. Because... She can live wherever she wants. I made that very clear. I don't care. It means nothing to me to pay her rent or to have her live here, but she chooses to live with me. Mm -hmm. Good. So I don't know totally from where we are if you can honestly say that Hank is... He just can't understand why his mother would want to live with him and as a form of bondage or you know, as it relates to the Jane. Yeah. You can't, you can't figure it out, but I... I think that's an important point. Reardon wonders why these people want to hold him. He's indifferent to them. He feels bad about being indifferent to them. He's not sure if he should be indifferent to them. He feels it's unjust at some points, but he, he feels indifferent to them. He really couldn't care less about them. And then he sometimes feels guilty about that. But they seem to care about him or want him in their lives or want to hold him. As, for example, his mother uh, chooses to live with him when she could live anywhere. He doesn't know why that is. And that's, I think, a real mystery for him. I think it's also, given the time, a good note for us to go out on. So we'll rejoin you next week talking about, uh, talking about the uh, chapter three, the um, top and the bottom.